morning everyone uh, we are heading off today we're leaving Belil we have been here uh, in Belil for three or four days now and it has been absolutely beautiful we've gone on gorgeous coastal walks the little village is lovely the drying harbor is very very charming and we have absolutely loved our time here however all good things must come to an end and uh, we have decided that uh, the time has come to head to a place we think we're going to head here, um, Piriac sur mer which is a little village um, near a river called the Vilaine. And our plan is to go into the Vilaine in a few days' time. So we're going to go to the marina first. Excuse the noise, Nick's just packing up the cockpit. We're going to go into the marina first, um, Piriac sur mer spend a couple of days there, get all of our jobs done that we cannot do while we are not um, attached to shore power and we, while we have limited water, so we're gonna do laundry, we're gonna get some of our computer work done. Um, they're the main two things, actually. Uh, we're just waiting for the weather to come through. Uh, that should be within the next five, 10 minutes. What time is that? So the um, forecast is just updated, but it's apparently gonna rain today. Well, we're in Biscay, so... Um... That's what we're going to get, and we're just looking at the wind. Yeah. When the wind till five seems fine, and it's nine now, so we've got eight hours of good wind. Yeah. So we're going to go? Yeah. I think so. Is that okay with you? Yeah. We're getting up a river mooring, so we need to be attention, pay attention to the direction of the current. So we're moored fore and aft. We're on a falling tide, so the last line that needs to be dropped is the stern line. Because we'll be a bit being pushed back this yes. way. Yes, yeah. Now it would appear that the little blue boat in front of us is just about to leave, so that makes our life slightly easier. Yeah, it's just here on, on port side. So we basically have got um, the, our primary uh, port of entry was a place called Piriac Sormer, and that has, from what we can gather, access from half tide upwards and we're literally going to hit that completely the opposite of that so we will be there at low water which means either picking up a mooring boy till about nine o'clock tonight which is no great shakes it doesn't get dark till 11. or we can do another thing which is to stop at Ile de Watt for lunch and just anchor there for a couple of hours we would do that but the weather is just it's not much fun it's a really beautiful island i'd like to see it in, in better light and the third option is continue to a third a tertiary port, which is our port after Piroax or Mer, which is the entrance to the Belain. Now, that gives us a couple of advantages. Number one, there's a big waiting pontoon there, uh, and it, the lock is only closed for an hour either side of low tide. So it's got a better access. The other thing is it's, it's, it's another two hours for us to get there, which means we'll have more water. Um, so from our point of view, um, we'll just be at sea longer, but that will give the tide a chance to flood a little bit. So there's not much wind today. We are putting out the code zero, or rather Nick is putting out the code zero. It's not that easy because we have the dinghy on the foredeck and that takes up the entirety of the foredeck. So flying, you may notice that we don't often fly coloured sails because it's just so difficult to work the foredeck. There is basically no room at all. And it's not particularly safe when there's any kind of swell. 
So, but anyway, we've got a following sea today, which is a lovely, and uh, Nick decided that the time has come to get that code zero out. But yeah, with the wind from behind, well, it was from behind and now it's kind of on the beam, so I don't know what's going on there, but uh, whatever it is, I like it. Hopefully we can get that code zero filled. Hopefully there's enough wind to do that. I think there is. It'd be quite nice to have the code zero up, actually. It's my favorite sail. Um, I don't know the last time we flew it. So how are we going? Yeah, good. Uh, we've got about four and a half knots. Uh, we've got a following C and we've got the code zero out. We're flying it as an asymmetric though. We've got the wind on the beam. It's pretty nice actually. Lovely. Um, following C, if all we need is a little bit of sunshine and we've kind of got the perfect bimble around. There's um, a little bit of a chicanery to do. There's about 20 rocks just below the surface that are charted. So we need to get ourselves around all that. The chart. Mm. I think the ones that are really near the surface have got boys because um, they are massive uh, obstacles to travel and to navigation. So what's our like wind speed and water speed? So we've got five knots apparent which off the beam means that we've got five knots true and we're doing 4.5 knots. It's actually a really nice place to sit up here. Or it would be if it weren't for this massive dinghy taking up all the space on the fore deck. Different cruising grounds are suited to different bits of kit and your dinghy is one of those items that, you know, it, it's like your car when you live on a boat. And, um, you know, sometimes you need like a little kind of compact run around and sometimes you need like a big 4x4 four four and, um, this is one of those situations where we just need something small, light, compact, ideally something we can inflate and deflate, but we've got this thing. It's fine, but it does take up a lot of room. I don't think the Code Zero is particularly happy. The wind seems to have shifted to come from behind and it's just been completely blanketed by the main at the moment, so I think we're just coming around this island here and um, we're going to change course very shortly, so we'll see how things settle then. I realised I had two UV filters on my camera. Does that make any difference? Can you see the difference? That's the second time we've seen a pod of dolphins that just aren't interested in coming over to say hello, which is kind of um, quite unusual. Really. So we're about an hour away from um, the river that we need to go down in order to get to the lock and uh, the depth in the river is um, is quite shallow and we're coming in at exactly the wrong time which is like bang on low water because that's uh, that's how we roll and uh, yeah so we have a bit of a question mark over whether or not we are going to be able to have enough water to actually get to the lock by the time we nose into here yeah I will be able to tell what we've got over data. Yeah. Yeah. What do we think we're going to have over data? It's difficult because the different tide, like if I push here, like if I push exactly on this bit here and look at the local tides, which is Penurth apparently, low water is at 5.30 and it's 1.6 over data. Yeah, that's, that's the same as what my app is saying. All right. So we've got 1.6 over datum. So how much depth should we have then? What does, what's chart datum? Well, you can work it out. So if we get in at four o'clock, we've got about 1.7, 1.8 over datum. Well, then that should be, and what's datum? 0.7. Shallows out at 0.6. So we should have two meters 
all the way. Yeah, at least. So we've got at least, with the keel up, yeah. with three bars, we should have at least a metre under us all the way. Did you follow all of that? If not, then let me explain a few points. So first of all, importantly, charts don't actually tell us the depth of the water because water depth is ever changing depending on the state of tide. So in this part of France, the tidal range is usually between three and five meters. So this obviously has big implications for times like this when you're trying to enter a river that has a very shallow entrance. So the depths given on a chart are referred to as chart datum which is generally the lowest you will ever expect the tide to fall. So in other words, the depth of the water should never fall below the depths given on a chart. Of course, the charts might be outdated, shoals shift all the time, but that's another story. Let's just assume the charts are correct for the purposes of this explanation. So on this day, we found ourselves in a situation where we were approaching the shallow river entrance at low water, which is obviously far from ideal. And we needed to work out whether we'd have enough depth at low water to enter. So in order to do this is a simple calculation. We add the height of tide, which we found using our tidal apps, to chart datum. And this will be our estimated depth. I hope that quick explanation was useful. Let's now get back to the episode. So this is going to be our route around here. And then once we reach here, we're in the channel and we're good. So this is the issue. One of our patrons says he keeps his boat near here and he sailed out to come and say hello, but sorry mate, we <laughs> we have a tide to catch. <laughs> tide of tide wait for no man and we're on a falling tide. We gotta get into the river. <laughs> you're doing you're gonna go seven two, seven two over. Listen, um, it looks a bit shallow as we go in, so the reason we're not slowing down is we're on a falling tide. No, I just, uh, you know, a quick say for me too, but uh, <laughs> I have to be at work tomorrow, so uh, I, uh, I need to uh, put back to the bottom and then I go uh, to <laughs> Okay, mate. I'm sorry we can't slow down. High, low waters in uh, two hours, and we're, we're, put, we're rushing a little bit. Over. No problem. So we hope to see you at some point over the next few weeks. I'm sorry, uh, sorry we couldn't uh, see you today. Over. The entrance to the Belain. This is our shallowest bit. Should be alright, we're rolling down when we're coming off the waves into about 1.7 metres, which still gives us 70 centimetres, so two foot under the hit under the um, under the boat. Two under foot. the hull or under the Well the same thing because the keel's up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we've got two foot. We've got 60 centimetres of water to play with. Not much, really. You know, we're East Coast sailing is all about like nosing a boat up a creek. Yeah, well, there's no doubt about that. And occasionally stuffing it up and spending anything up to, if like, you get neat, like three days on your side. Remember when Robert parked his boat in a field accidentally? <laughs> yeah, there were like sheep grazing around <laughs> the boat the next morning. <laughs> the story is, this is, uh, we come from an east coast marina in the UK that only has access one hour either side of high water and we were going for a weekend away to the whole yacht club. High water was at 3am so everyone had to be up on deck at 2am and out of the creek by 3.30am and my friend Robert and I and several others were in the pub until 11pm so we were all a little bit the worse for wear. Anyway he got up we all got up in the pitch black, motored out of the creek, which is a meandering creek that goes on for about half a mile to get to deeper water. And it's worth noting that even if you stay within the void channel, you yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not easy navigation. You still go aground, yeah. even within the channel. I was actually the boat behind Robert, and he grounded the boat, uh, and rather than turning to starboard, to cut or reversing off and turning to starboard, for some strange reason, decided just to give the boat like full throttle. Because occasionally you get like a little bump of mud. 
Anyway, Robert then ends up 200 metres further on before the boat does ground to a halt. But what happened was that the water all went out, he couldn't move at all. And then when he woke up, he's like, yeah, I'm in a field. And on the clubhouse wall of our local yacht club, there is a picture of Robert's boat in a field surrounded by sheep. And what I want to know is who took that picture? The entire yacht club went down there the <laughs> next day to take the piss out of it. <laughs> it's uh, calmed down a lot. The swell has calmed down completely. It's um, pretty flat now, so that makes it a lot more comfortable um, in terms of depth. We've still got 1.7, 1.8, but it's, um, it's not really an issue when the water is flat. All right, you're not gonna be able to see this on film, I don't think, but the, <laughs> the red boy, I don't think I'll be able to find it on the film. Anyway, the red boy is around there and the green boy is about there-ish. Uh, we can see the boy channel, so we're gonna make our way towards that. And then it's 10 past four right now. Low water's up at about quarter past five. I think we'll have to wait for the lock because the lock is apparently closed at low water, although it depends on the exact height of tide. How's our depth? It's still quite shallow. Pretty shallow. It says we've got 2.6 meters, but you can see that like it very quickly shallows out and there's just like mud flats right, right there. Well, the good, I suppose the good news is that you know that you do ground, you're grounding in mud. Yeah, that's right. You can see all the, um, all the birds just on the edge of the water. Well, there's, that's uh, East Coast cruising, isn't it? Yeah. When the birds are walking. <laughs> Don't go towards where the birds are walking. Number one. Okay, pretty far away, babe. motored about what five miles up this river it's starting to get pretty shallow we're just about we must be at actually low water it's quarter past five <laughs> because our timing is excellent <laughs> and uh, there is we're just around the corner we're just going around a bend and right before the lock there looks like there's like a seal it's actually probably because of the lock itself we had this on the French canals like on the on the like um, downward side or the seaward side of the lock you'd often get like a sill because of the turbulence of the water but yeah I think if the chart is to be believed we're definitely going to go aground just after we round this bend. We could do a Robert. Let's plow through. It sucks a lot of mud into the uh, I think I think we're better off just waiting until we're afloat. If we go around we'll just wait until we're floating again. Yeah but it's 20 past five isn't it? So this is the lock, obviously. That's the uh, shallow patch. And that's where we are. The wading pontoon is right there. And that is the lock. We made it to the waiting pontoon without going aground, but as we were looking for a space to tie up, we noticed that the lock was actually open with a green light indicating that we could enter. We called up, but there was no answer from the lock keeper, so we cautiously approached. Okay, there was some tide has turned, which means that you're going to get pushed into the lock, which means that we're going to be having to use reverse thrust to get out of this, yeah? We're chains, I think. I'm in, I'm in neutral. I'm trying to get past these oysters. The lock keeper soon appeared and directed us to a space behind another boat and we tied up to the chains in the wall, put our life jackets on as per the local rules and waited for the lock keeper to activate the lock. Well, lock gates closed. Actually, as coincidence would have it, a year ago today was the, when we left the locks in France the last time. The lock gates opened and we found ourselves motoring down the Vilaine, a large river that has been turned into a canal, meaning that for the time being we didn't need to worry about tides or depths. As the mist rolled in and the evening started to fall, we embarked on the last leg of our passage. Our uh, next down below cooking some dinner, it's uh, 6.30 so we are, we're in, we're into the Vilaine. That is exciting.
But here we are and it is so pretty. I know that it's raining and so you can't really appreciate it, particularly probably on camera, but it is stunning. Uh, we are aiming ultimately for a place called La Roche Bernard and it is a, apparently a lovely little medieval town. There's um, a marina there and that's where we're going to stay. Anyway, I can smell pasta, so Nick's got dinner on. Um, I'm excited. Today's gone well. It's been a big day. It was way bigger than I was expecting. But um, yeah, it's been a good day so far. God almighty. Well, we're here, babe. It's been a very long day, actually. Today was one of those really long, slow days. It just... I enjoy it. It wasn't a bad day. We went from getting out and not even sure being sure we were going to leave. Mm. We actually settled on our third passage plan after we set off. Anyway, well done, babe. Mm. Yeah, well done. Thanks for watching this week's episode. And uh, we'll see you next week. Where, well, I'm assuming we're going to, going to be exploring La Roche Bernard and the Lane. Yeah. That's what we'll be doing next week's episode. Bye. A huge shout out to our wonderful patrons. If you would also like to become a patron and support our independent and impartial content, then please click on the link in the description below. Our patrons get loads of perks and benefits, including ad-free content and exclusive live chats, as well as much, much more. Otherwise, please subscribe to our channel, leave a comment down below, give us a thumbs up and share if you loved this episode. See you next week.